agriculture, easy composting with worms. And now that I did that, how do I change the screen, Emily? You can hit the space bar or the arrow button. Sweet, okay. Ha, so what is vermiculture? Vermiculture is the practice of farming worms in or outdoors by feeding organic organic matter and food scraps to increase their population and produce fertile compost. There's two different reasons usually why people go into it. A lot of people just want the worms. So some, the one reason is to farm worms for the purpose of selling. The other one is because, well, like us, they want the compost. And then you have an option three, of course, is for both. And, you know, that's Totally acceptable because I mean, if you're composting good, you're going to have an overabundance of worms that you can share, give away, or you know, just make more farms. So they kind of go hand in hand and they're great. I love my worms, they're so much fun. And, and a lot of people are like creepy about worms, but they're great. So, why choose worm composting? It's cheap and easy to set up can be kept inside for year-round composting. It's fast and easy disposal of kitchen waste. And if you're like me and you have kids, you always have kitchen scraps. The worms do all the work. So, you know, composting is great, but composting with worms is so much better because you don't have to stress about everything being perfect. And you don't have to worry as much about you know, turning it and making sure the heat's this or that and watering it. You have to just pretty much you add your stuff, keep it moist, and the worms do the bulk of the work for you. And I mean, I would love anyone to come do the work for me on anything. So I, I'm glad to let them do it. So then you get convenient access to worm castings for your early seed starting, which is great because Plants that have access to the worm castings, the composted material left over from your worm farm, they grow just so much better. Their seeds uh, start sooner, the plants grow bigger, stronger, faster, they're just healthier. And my favorite reason is it's fun. I love, like I said, I love my worms and I, you know, dig in and I, I'm weird. I bring out the whole tote and stick my hands in and turn it and just to see how everyone's doing. And, you know, they don't mind. So I do it anyway. Hey, Amanda, so, I have a question. Um, so yeah. you, actually, you actually start your seeds in worm castings? I did um, that time. You saw the pictures. Those were my plants I had started this last winter in my worm castings. And they did great. Um, I ended up having some mite issues, but it didn't come from, from that. It came from a, a house plant that I had gotten. It was actually, it was ginger root from a store that was organic. And I wanted to plant it and see how that would work. And it had mites in it. And so I ended up having to scrap everything because I couldn't get control of the mites. But what I had grown then, it was great. They were amazing. So they, they did really well. Um, if you're worried about your dirt not being composted enough or there being bugs or anything like that, you can stick it in the oven and cook it. Um, shoot, I meant to write that down. I think it's, it's one, yeah. You can cook it at 180 or 200 in the oven, but you wanna get like a, a meat thermometer or something because you want the dirt to actually cook at 200 for about 20, 30 minutes but not any longer than that because then after that you start killing anything good in it and it also will if you overcook it it releases toxins in the soil that your plants don't like and you can smell it it doesn't make you feel good either so um but if you cook it it'll kill any of the bugs you could also freeze it and it'll kill bugs too any bug that are alive any of the eggs it'll kill them freezing it so but the thing with the compost from your worm farm is it's full of microorganisms that help your plants grow. So you want to keep it moist. You don't want to dry it out. So cooking it without drying it out can be a little challenging. So you want to keep that stuff alive. And it actually, and we'll get to that, but it actually, the worm composting and everything, the microorganisms in them help to fight back other pests and bugs that might 
damage your plants. So thank you. Yeah. So vermicompost benefits. So there's about 10 times more beneficial microbes in worm compost than there is in regular compost you do outside. It's higher in nitrogen, magnesium, potassium, calcium, and phosphorus than regular compost. It also has traces of iron, copper, zinc, sodium, and sulfur that's not normally found in compost, which we all need here in Alaska in our soil. Retains nutrients better than compost. It contains more plant growth hormones than compost to help increase the growth of your plants. It improves seed germination, which is great for seed starting. That's why I said that. So it also is smaller. So a lot of times when you compost down in your yard, you got bigger chunks of things. But when usually when you're composting in your home or with the worm farm, everything's going to be smaller so that the worms can break it down. So you're not going to have the big chunks of everything for the seeds to try to break through. So it's much better for the seed germination than regular compost or outside soil would be. So um, it's got microorganisms in a form that's more accessible to plants to draw from. And it's got organic micronutrients. It's high in hummus, which is that nice spongy um, texture to that comes from more of the a lot of the woody plants will give a more of a hummus thing, but um, it has better water retention and uh, nutrients. It's great for your plants. It helps to, it, it has the water retention plus it allows for drainage. So it's, hummus is what you want, it's, especially if you have a lot of clay. Um, it improves soil for the drainage, drainage uh, porosity, aeration and structure. Worm rye products such as urine, mucus, poop, et cetera. So I know everyone's like, ah, oh, worm byproducts. You got urine, mucus, poop, gross. Get this, it's so cool. So worms, if you've ever handled them, they have the slime. That's the mucus they're talking about. And that slime, you would think, ew, what good is that? That stuff helps bind everything together to hold all the nutrients and keeps your soil together and keeps it moist and it actually helps break down things for your plants. It's very beneficial. So next time you're holding a worm, you think, oh my God, it's so slimy, it's so disgusting. You could think, oh, that is amazing for my plants. My plants are gonna grow so much better thanks to that. You can go wipe it on your plant, it won't hurt it. So the gut enzymes from the worms promote beneficial bacteria and fungi. So as they're eating stuff, breaking it down, their gut enzymes are combining with it. They're pooping it out and castings is worm poop. And so it's all in there and it goes into that and you're giving it to your plants and it is helping to promote the beneficial bacteria and fungi that you want in your soil to grow your plants and to keep away pests and disease. So, I mean, worms are amazing. So it helps suppress pests and plant disease, as mentioned. Contains few contaminants because, well, these are things that most people are keeping in their house. So you're not gonna be just throwing chemicals in it. You're not spraying it with stuff. You don't want that stuff in your house. You don't want it in your worm bin. So free of toxins, pathogens, weed seeds. Only if you're not adding those things, of course. So with my worm bin, it's in the house. I do not put things from outside into it. My plants in the house, I'll only put pieces of them in there if I know that there's no bugs on them. But I did read recently, a lady said she takes everything, throws it in because the ecosystem of the worm then takes care of itself and incorporates it. I didn't want to risk it. I figured it's a small scale ecosystem. And I want to put in it what I want to get out of it. So I don't even put it in if I think there's any chance of it being infested with a pest that I don't want in my house or some sort of disease. So that means the leaves from outside, I don't put in. Um, then there's, oh, so it takes like three to six months to complete a worm bin. It's just not long. And if you've ever composted in, in Alaska, you know it's, almost impossible to actually compost anything here. You have to really know what you're doing. I mean, it's doable, but it's slow. This is wonderful because you can start it whenever you want and be harvesting from it. You can um, harvest 
to make the tea to water your indoor plants in the wintertime, or you can stockpile it for the summer and the spring when you want to start your seed starts. So, I mean, it's great. And you can never have too much of it. Honestly, you just can't because if you garden, it's just like gold. It's, it's amazing. So basically everything on this other side is just a breakdown of everything I just said. This um, just was a little bit more compact for you. So uh, the slow nutrition release though, number seven, the worm castings, the nutrients are held in place and released slowly so that the plants receive what they need over a prolonged period. I love that. And this doesn't say that here, but I read somewhere else that the worm compost actually releases the nutrients more slowly than regular compost. So it's going to just keep feeding your plants for even longer, which is great because who wants to have to go out and constantly feed your plants? Watering them is a pain enough, but without having to worry about feeding them or overfeeding them and adding the right stuff. I love gardening, but I'm not a scientist and I, I would rather not have to worry about how much nitrogen or iron or phosphorus, whatever is going into it. This is just easier. So there are three main types or ways of vermiculture. And vermiculture, like I said, is, is the whole farming of worms. So there's manual, which is more for small scale farmers. And um, these are the ones you would do in like your home kitchen or somewhere in your house. It's got just for the kitchen compost. So your worms are harvested with your hands from the soil. The worms are removed by hand using one of a couple methods to isolate the worms from the compost, which we'll go over a little later. So then the soil with worms are kept on a flat tray and exposed to light. The worms dive low to avoid the light. The top layer of compost is removed by hand and worms are harvested when exposed. So it's all very like easy peasy lemon squeezy, just a little thing in your house. And for the second type, it's migration. So there's two different types of migration. There's downward migration and upward migration. And I'm sure if anyone's ever looked into worm uh, farming, they've seen the towers, the black towers stacked up the trays. And uh, Uncle Jim's worm farm tends to sell those. They're pretty popular. I've got two of them and I used them for a number of years. They're not my favorite for me. There are many different reasons and there's different people who like to do things different ways. So it, it, I'm sure it works fine for other people. For me, I wanna be able to put more in that tray at a time. And I also don't wanna to have to worry about it drying out or having to rotate it. I'm pretty much throw it all in the bin. Everyone's living happy together in one layer and I can dig in and turn it and see everybody without having to stack and stack and rotate. And not my cup of tea, but it works good for some people. So not going to shut that down. But, um, you know, um, there's pros and cons to everything. So for the downward migration, there's a box with pea or another organic matter placed beneath the box or tray for the screen bottom. And it's a tray that the worms and bedding are placed. A light over the top forces the worms down through the screen and into the bottom to be collected. So this one, they're just, you're like feeding from the top and you're trying to force your worms down and you're gonna pull from the top, I guess. But so then the other one, the up, upward migration, I, how does, yeah. So basically the same thing, I guess like that's more of like a harvesting tip. So um, da -da -da -da. my brain's going a thousand miles an hour, sorry. The upward migration is those towers. And with those, you know, you've got your worm bedding set up in your base and you're feeding them. And then as that fills up, you're putting another tray on and you're feeding them. So with this one, and I was talking to a local worm farmer that usually when you first start it, the first couple trays of your worm farm aren't gonna be composted all the way. You know, your worms are just getting situated and getting cozy. And in the meantime, you're adding more stuff. So they're gonna move up towards more stuff before they finish off. So you just take those bottom ones and stick them up on top and they'll go through again and you can um, uh, have them redo it, compost it and, and it's usable. And it's usable basically when 
nothing looks like anything anymore. It just looks like dirt. So then the third one is for like large scale, or actually I'd like to set this thing up. It's the mechanical. This is a, a smaller scale mechanical harvester. There's huge ones I found online. They're massive. They remind me of like the cement turners, you know? So a mechanical harvester is used to spin the worms from their castings and bedding with use of different size screens that allow the bedding to fall through, but not the worms. The worms come out the end and fall into a wheelbarrow or other container. So these are for like big tubs of worms. You wanna just get it all in and over with. So they have um, some of these that are more high end, larger, and the screen is different sizes going down. So your larger stuff's falling out and then your smaller stuff and then your worms come out the other end. And if you wanna see anything like comical, Google harvesting worms with a mechanical harvester because I saw this one video and they're spinning it and the worms are just going in a circle and flying out the end. It was like a little circus in a tube. It was pretty cool. So any questions on that? Yeah, Marza, do you want to ask your question there? Because I wasn't sure. Marza was wondering the source for the mechanical sorter. Is it John W's rotating screen harvester? Um, that one, actually, I believe it is from, yep, John W's rotating screen harvester, that link. Yeah. Um, He's got where he's set up and done it. And I, I believe somewhere in there is a link to how he put it together. And, um, but honestly, if you Google those, you can come up with some really neat ones. There's some that are better looking than that, that are still made out of five gallon buckets in screen. So um, if that's what you're interested in, I would really recommend Googling it. And for underneath there, I know he's got that tote, but a 50 gallon barrel, you know, like those plastic ones cut long ways in half underneath that would be awesome because you're not gonna miss anything. But yeah, that's that's who that is. So, um, and at the end, there's a long resource page of all the links and places that I have found things. And I can go back and put this in as a shareable PDF and that if anyone's interested in, it can be sent to them. So some of the setup styles, is there anyone else with questions before I move forward? No? So setup styles, there's all different ways of doing it. If you're down in the States, as always with anything, it's gonna be a little different. I, some of the pictures are from down in the States where you could, they do a lot of things outside, but I did that because I want to show that you can do it outside, but you can take the same technique and do it inside in a larger space if you wanted to, or even just with like a hoop of plastic over it. So bear with me. Hard to find pictures of things in Alaska, you know. So this is the windrow style. And it's um, when a worm bed is made in a long row, it is referred to as a windrow. These people put things along the side to keep it contained. They're keeping the worms from migrating out and to help protect it from things coming in to get them. So with this style, you lay your bedding and compost on a concrete floor or outside at a minimum of six to inches thick, six to 10 inches thick. So then you inoculate the windrow with the worms. You add organic matter and layers to the winter, like you would composting, you know, you do your straw, your dead stuff, you do your live greens, whatever. And if you have food stuff, you can throw it in there. See, so then you want to cover it for protection from outdoor elements and predators and to keep it from drying out or vice versa, being flooded. You know, too much water is not a good thing either. So if it's outside and not on concrete, you use woven plastic sheet or permeable cloth under the windrow. And the purpose of that is one, it, it does help keep your worms contained in the row, as well as it helps prevent um, stuff from leaking down into the ground and encouraging moles and, and shrews and things that tunnel under to get to stuff. So it just helps a little with that. I mean, if something wanted to get in, they're gonna get in, but 
it, it's some protection. So then this, um, if you were to put it directly on the ground, another way of doing it, directly on the ground without the sides protecting, keeping it enclosed, they do one row with the food and the worms. And then they set up another row right in front of it, across from it, whatever. And then the worms, as they finish off their one row, they migrate right over to that other row where all the food is. And then the ones that the worms have left, that row is harvested and taken off and used. So, which is great because if you're doing it in the garden, like it says for direct garden use, this is awesome. You dig a trench in your garden. And I know you've seen this on some of the things on the computer and TV or whatever, how they've done the little trenches alongside their beds or somewhere in the garden and they've thrown vegetable scraps in it or leaves and things. So this, you can throw your worms in. They're gonna be in that, but they're not gonna stay there. If there's no food, they're gonna leave. But also, what it's also doing when you do that, you're luring in other worms that are local in your area to come in and, and use all that and eat it. So you're drawing more worms to your garden, which is great because while they're eating that stuff, they are making compost. They are aerating your soil around, around the trench or where your plants are and helping to feed them with their castings as they go. But one of the things is, is um, Heidi Rader told me at the last presentation I did that um, the red wrigglers are an invasive species in Alaska. So you don't want to put them directly outdoors where they can access the wild and just take over. So um, you'd want to make sure that it was contained in some way. You could totally line it and contain it. And then if they're not going to go out into your garden, but you can keep them outside for the season and still have them composting versus having them in your house if you wanted to. So next style is a wedge style. Now this one might look intimidating. I was having a really hard time finding something that would illustrate how this wedge style works. So a wedge style does not have to be inside of a building but the utilizes corners because it's starting in the corner and it's creating a wedge out. So I'll read through this for you. It's wedge style refers to the use of corners inside of a shed or other similar structure to construct your worm bed. Organic material, manure, etc., is added to one corner, increasing it in size by adding to the outer slope. After the wedge has been built up over time and the words, worms have composted the material, the vermicompost can be removed from the back end of the wedge because they're moving forward, right? So you harvest it all from the back. So if you were to put a covering over it, it helps protect it from predators. You can uh, control the temperature better. So not only are you having the worms do it, but you're kind of doing like a hot compost too because now you can control the temperature, the wetness, and you can get to it season long. This is what I liked about this one. Winter time, this would totally work for you. It'd be awesome. And I'll show you soon, I've got um, further down when the local farmer does something similar to this outside and I'll show that to you and how he does it when I get there. I love this illustration. Direction of wave motion in worm bed. Feed is always added to this side of the bed after mulching and tenuous feeding, this side of the bed becomes larger and pushes across. The back side of the bed, rich with castings, can be removed for sale. This side is prone to weeds and aggressive grasses. Yeah, because it's like at the tail end. So it's the anything that's fresh soil that's left for seeds from the weeds to get to is, is going to move in and take it over. And I mean, huh. They're going to love that. So you're not going to want to leave that uncovered and not use it. You're going to want to cover it until you can use it or you want to harvest it and use it. Otherwise, the seeds move in so quick. Um, reactor. Couldn't find a whole lot on this one. It utilizes machinery to aid in farming of worms and or compost. So this is a little machine. They've got some massive ones. 
and you use it to harvest your worms. You, they grow in it. You can, there's like little plates and things on the bottom that sift out the compost at the bottom for you. And um, I would think that would get kind of tricky, but I don't know if they vibrate it through the screens. There's so many different ways of doing it that I saw. And it's, it would take a lot of research to figure out like what kind of setup for that you would want versus others and how big and things. But that one I liked because that looks like it could fit in my house. And I thought, ooh, look at that. So this is for more like the household kitchen style bins. This uh, darling little blue one right here, this is actually mine in my house. And it's just a tote that I took and cut a hole on the top and hot glued screen into and filled up. There's no other air holes in that. And I did that because it's in my house and it's Alaska and we use a wood stove. You see my heater there. We don't run that unless we're not home in the winter time, but we use mostly the wood stove. So everything dries out. So I didn't want a lot of moisture to escape. So I didn't do the holes on the side. And you know, everyone talks about the spigot. I never have excess water. So mine doesn't have that. So for the bin, beds and bin styles, you can keep them in anything. They don't even have to be this big. You can keep them in a milk jug or one of those big ice cream containers or one of the big um, high cheese containers my husband's always bringing home from Costco. You can keep them in anything. Um, you just have to make sure they have food, proper moisture, protection from predators, proper ventilation, correct temperature and dark. They do not like the light. Those clear toads down there, I don't see that they would have loved that too much. They like the dark ones. And I did these to show that there are different ways you can set it up. My mine's just the single. And this one stacked them. And the lid here has screen between for them to go through. And this one, they stack down in it. And when they do that, they put like a brick or something down in there to keep it from going flat. So they have a space. But I really like these trays too, because these are a little screen and then you could sift them if you wanted to. So to me, I think that, wow, that might actually work double. And I like this one better than the worm farm one because the worm farm one tucks down the, the tower, the, the worm tower, sorry. The worm tower tucks down like this clear tote. So then you're compacting it and there's not as much space as you think there is. Like it, it'll be this thick of a tray but it's going to stick down in there like this one. And so then there's like no room. I hate that about the towers. But this one, you know, I thought that actually looks effective and it's cute, which, you know, that's important, right? It's got to be cute. So this is tower versus tote that I did for my last presentation for just the kitchen um, small scale worm gardeners. So I kept it in here because I don't know how many of you wanted to do large scale or how large of a scale you want to go. So, so this is tower versus tote. The Worm Factory 360 from Uncle Jim's is $149.99. At least it was when I checked it this last year. And it only comes with four stacking trays. It's got that handy little spigot though for draining your worm tea, which I've ne never had. Even with that tower, I've never had it. And then my handy little tote, $14.99 at Fred Meyers. I got a roll screen for $10 at Home Depot, but if you recycle it from something else at home, it's free, right? And I use that screen for everything because I raise mealworms too, so it doesn't go to waste. So the tower pros and cons. It's got a pleasing appearance. It's a pro, right? It's cute, looks effective, saves space, has worm teeth spigot, and trays for harvesting, casting. So the bottom tray here, this one, has got this nifty little, um, tray that sits down in there that's supposed to help catch worms. So if any of them go down through that bottom tray, they'll, um, instead of drowning in the worm tea, they have like a, like a level, an angled plastic edging that they crawl up out of it. And uh, so then the cons, it requires more attention. You have to pay attention to it because it'll dry out easier. Um, I found that it was difficult to bury my food scraps. And that to me is essential to keep the fruit flies away and other bugs. You wanna bury it inside of the castings and the soil that you have in there, the bedding. 
and it attracts more pests because you can't bury it and because you're constantly adding to the top and the worms are having taking time to move up to that then you get mold and you get other bugs and it didn't work for me but um it would work for someone who didn't have as much scraps as me <laughs> um so I found the worms didn't always want to move up through the trays. Some of them would stay down below, some would move up, some would, would go down into the bottom tray where the water's supposed to be. They, worms are made to dig. So the worms that you use for composting, they, while they do stay in that top layer of soil in your garden, they do dig. So if you don't have a lot of bedding soil in your tray to begin with, where are they gonna go? I mean, they're gonna go down, right? They're just gonna leave the tray. So I always had issues getting them to follow the food up. But I've read a lot of things, people love these towers. So don't let me you know, throw you off to that. The other con is it's expensive to start. My tote holds a lot of composting material. Mine is so heavy right now. I've got it filled up to right about here, that ledge there. And I'm harvesting from it. But I mean, it's great. It holds a lot and I can dig down, throw my food scraps in, cover it up and not have to worry about a whole lot of anything with it. It's doing its thing, they're eating it and they're happy. So that was number two, easy to bury your food scraps, which keeps the bugs away. And, you know, it's not gonna smell if it's buried either. So there's the other thing with the Worm Factory 360, if the worms aren't getting to it fast enough, you're putting too much food in and they're not able to compost and move up quick enough, then you end up with food rotting, which stinks and who wants that? Okay, so the tote allows for a real ecosystem to establish, which if you've ever composted is super important. And that was something that I really wanted to um, quote, point out and to drive home. Your worm bin is an ecosystem. Oh. You have to keep it in balance. And that might sound intimidating or complicated, but it's not. It's really easy, but you know if, your worms aren't happy, or if there's pests moving in that shouldn't be, your ecosystem's out of balance. It's like, okay, what can I do to make this better? And if it helps to look at it like you have a hamster in its little aquarium and you're keeping him alive, he's got his bedding, he's got his food, he's got his water, he's happy, he's eating, he's healthy, and there's no smells, there's no pests, and he's like I said, he's healthy and happy. But if anything is wrong in his ecosystem, you're gonna start getting smells, you're gonna start getting bugs. He's not gonna look happy, he's gonna be meaner probably, or just lethargic, and he's gonna get sick and he might even die. So, but why? What's off? You know, do you're giving him water, food, is his is his bedding clean, or did you give him the appropriate bedding? And hopefully you didn't give him cat litter and he ate the cat litter and now he's poisoned. So I mean, it's really easy. It's not like you're managing an ecosystem like the world. It's just this tiny little box of worms, and you're just feeding the worms what they need and giving them what they need. So Sizes with this varies. Um, you can do any size you want. And there's all kinds of different size totes. You don't even have to use a tote. Screens, they allow the light in, which is awesome because I know I said worms do not like light, but when you want to get them established, this is a trick that you're gonna wanna know when you go to set up your worms. When you first set them up, they're gonna freak out and scatter. And uh, nothing's going to set your spouse off more than your worms uh, trailing across your floor and drying into little strings, crusty little strings everywhere. You're going to be like, oh my God, what have you done? Get them out. So a lamp above it to let the light in keeps the worms down in the bedding. They don't like the light, so they dig down. And it keeps them there and keeps them contained. 
So if you have a light source at the top of your toe, you know your worms aren't just gonna leave. You have a little bit of comfort in knowing, ah, yeah, they're gonna stay there. So that, that's great. And it also allows for ventilation. And, um, you know, because ventilation is important, even though I don't have a lot. Some people just put holes right along the side of here and leave these holes without putting screen over them. I don't recommend that because you're going to have a lot more bugs getting access to it that way. And it would be easier for your worms to crawl out too. If you're going to put holes, put screen over it. So one of the pros to this is it's cheap start. Can be made from any container. Cons, no drainage, but that's something you can add. I just didn't need it. It can be tricky to harvest composted castings. And that's something that I finally figured out. It took me a while to wrap my brain around how to do all this, but I'm a little slower to some things than some people. So, you know, it's, um, I'm also very particular. I, I don't want to let any of my eggs get away from me or any of my worms. So the thought of them going out to the garden or into a pot to die just doesn't make me happy. I want them in my worm farm. Because I mean, if all my eggs are gone, then I'm not gonna have any worms. But um, it took me a while to figure that out. And we'll get into that later. So they may not be visually appealing. But I mean, it's just a tote sitting there in the corner. Nobody notices it. I pull it out, play with them whenever I want to. I dig in whole clumps and I love them, they're fun. I like to get it out when the kids' friends come over. Some of them think it's great and others think, oh my God, what a weirdo. So this is medium to large scale setups that I found online. Um, like these are huge, obviously. And the top one is outside. And, but I thought if this was something that was being done inside of a community center or garage, this is something you could do. Um, one of the things though that I had found when I first started doing my worm farm that I haven't found anywhere since I was researching for my presentation is that these particular worms, I guess there isn't a way, but don't want the depth as much as they want surface. So you don't need to have two feet deep as long as you have like two feet wide. You know, they want the surface space. They come up to get air and to eat at that surface level. They also are not going to reproduce more than their habitat can sustain. So you'll get a bunch of worms, you'll notice there'll be a lot, but then they'll quit reproducing if there's too many of them. So if you wanna keep them reproducing, pull some worms out and sell them, you know, or start another bin. This one I liked the thought of, cause this is just a regular compost bin that you would do outside. But you could do it inside too if you wanted. The screens, I like this theory, and I might try this out. You could put all your food into one end, you got them doing their thing, and then when, when you want them to leave that, you put start putting the food and stuff, the bedding into the next one, and they'll go through the screen and migrate over. And then once you feel like you've got them established in the one, you can pull the other one. I like that idea versus digging in the toe and pulling it out. But like I said, if you put the light over it, the worms go down lower and you can just keep harvesting from the top. And this was another one I thought would work inside of a building if someone was doing something larger scale, which I wish I had room for something like this. It would make me so happy. Um, and notice the lid, which is very important because it keeps out pests. Your cat, oh my God, you don't want your cat in there. Ruin everything. And um, it keeps the, you know, moist. Did I say that already? Dark, moist, pass out. The stacking worm bin can be, this can be as large or as small as you want. And I was trying to find a picture. I couldn't find one of, um, I saw a video on YouTube. The guy had shelves and he had, instead of these kind of trays, they were rounded like, like a long barrel cut in half, but they're smaller. They're like, you know, not very long and they were rounded and he just stuck them in um, the shelves and just did them in individual trays and dealt with them from there instead of stacking and having to coax them in or out. He just did one tray at a time on a tall wall of shelves. So I thought that was pretty cool. So um, any questions?
Yeah, Amanda, um, you had a question. Do you have pictures of the red wiggler versus native worms? Yes, I have pictures and stuff. Um, we're going to get to I put everything in the different categories because I thought two hours I needed to fill time. So I made sure I grouped everything. We'll get there. <laughs> okay, and, and don't feel like you need to go two hours. Um, I'm trying to go as fast as I can. <laughs> Um, are there other questions that people have? You can just unmute yourself. No. Is everybody bored yet? I have a question. Okay. So I'm in Soldatna and I think you're in Soldatna also. Can I get worm? Can I buy some worms from you? Can you put your phone number or email in the chat for everybody? Um, yeah, I can do that. Um, however, <laughs> I don't have any extra worms right now because I got um, earwigs that ate my worms. So I only have a handful of worms that I'm coming back. I could give you some of their, their um, bedding and their eggs though, and you can start them from the eggs if you wanted to try that. Okay, that would be really fun. Yeah, I'll, I, I I can put, um, I'll put your email in the chat, Amanda. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, any other questions? Anybody? Okay. So moving on to composting worms. Maybe. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So earthworms. There's between 7,000 and 9,000 species of earthworms. Amazing number of worms. There's no way I'm going to be able to tell you how to ID all these worms. But I guarantee you, if you find it out in your garden, it is not a red wriggler. It is an earthworm. And there is differences. And a red wriggler is an earthworm. But it's the one you would find out in your garden is a common earthworm, so to say. So. They do two different jobs, and we'll get into that in a minute. But so there's seven species suitable for composting. Out of 7,009 or 9,000 species of earthworms, only seven species suitable for composting, and only four species available in the United States. I mean, that is huge. So three class of earthworms based on their burrowing capabilities and habitats are, I cannot say these words. I meant to Google them and listen to, to see the correct pronunciation of them. Uh, I'm gonna say anisic worms and I'm probably slaughtering it, but I'm sorry, that's my Southern education and phonics just let me down. So they are strong vertical and horizontal burrowers. They forage for organic matter at the soil surface to take back to their home. They're not gonna stay there. They're like gone. They're capable of pulling whole leaves down tunnels, extending nine feet below ground. I mean, uh, I would love to have some of these worms just because amazing. I'd love to see this in action. I'd want to put it in a glass thing and watch them work. But while that's great and their burrowing is great for aerating your soil, they're not going to be good composters. They're not hanging out in that top layer they're nine feet below ground, which here is probably gravel anyway. So you don't want those. Um, I hate that I didn't look these up. Uh, and the g -sick worms, they're horizontal or upper soil burrowers. Rarely come to surface except to forage. Shallow, unstable tunnels feed well below surface, making them unsuitable for composting. So. These are not going to do you so great either. This is what you want. And um, yet again, at the geic worms, they inhibit the surface soil, right? You know, like the top six inches is probably their favorite. And they actually don't stay in the soil. If there's leaves on the ground, they're going to be in the leaves. So they, they love the surface soil, leaf litter, manures, and other loosely packed environments. They're not big burrowers. They're not gonna go nine feet below the surface. They're not gonna stay way up underneath the ground. 
They would not survive in most garden soils, especially in heavy clay, because they can't, they're not strong diggers. And since they live or near the surface, they would freeze out. They would never last through a winter. And they, they eat microbe rich organic waste. So that's when you say like the organic waste, that's the leaves, that's the plant pieces, that's, that's all the stuff that hasn't been composted. That's what you want them eating. And that's where you're gonna find them. Um, because of that, because they're right up there eating all that stuff, they're great composters. And they're the ones that make up all your composting worms. The best worms for composting, here are your four worm species. So I put red wriggler. They're called red wriggler or red wiggler. And so you'll see it spelled both ways in here, but I have found that they're referred to both ways, both spellings. And so that particular species is most common for composting in the United States and Canada. They reproduce quickly. They have a wide range of temperature tolerance from 55 degrees to 95 degrees, which is awesome because you don't want them to freeze right away and you don't want them to overheat. And some of the worms do not like the heat and they'll leave or die. And what I also love about them is that they're the cheapest of the species. They have a yellowish tail and they have banding over their body that's, and they're smaller and less muscular. These are the ones that you're really gonna want. The European night crawler is a larger cousin of the red wriggler and he prefers cooler temperatures Good composter used for fishing, and but he reproduces more slowly. You can use him in conjunction with your red wriggler because of, um, no, not him, the African nightcrawler, I'm sorry. Maybe it is the European you can do as well. Anyways, you can use them all in conjunction together, I, I do believe, from the guy I was talking to. Um, I haven't tried that yet. But he says, because some of them will eat the stuff at the top. If you have a really deep bed, you might want some of the bigger ones for the bottom composting. But if you're just doing it in your house, you're not gonna have to worry about a really deep bed that would require a worm to sit at the bottom and compost stuff because your worm up top's doing it as you're adding it to it. So um, the European eye crawler, you know, he prefers the cooler temperatures and a good composter. He's used for fishing, but he reproduces more slowly. The Indian or Malaysian blue, prefers warmer tropical climates. He would not like it here. He's sensitive to barometric pressure, which um, you don't want mass exodus from your worm bins just because the, the, the temperatures, not the temperature, but the pressure outside changes. And these will leave if that changes. Um, African nightcrawler, they're large composting worm requiring warmer temperatures. They begin to die at temperatures 60 and below. They can be used alongside red wrigglers since African night crawlers prefer deeper depths. But I mean, it gets to be 60 and lower in my house most of the year. So I wouldn't want them. I'd have to run a heater to keep them alive. And so to me, that's not efficient. Um, the, the red wriggler is pretty much what you want. He's, he's kind of like, the, I, I guess, like the Jersey cow, you know, he's like the one that you're going to see used the most because he's more versatile to what we have, right? So I don't know, maybe that was a bad um, example, but so the red wriggler versus the common earthworm. So red wriggler is a great composter, it's eating decaying matter at or near the soil surface, while the common earthworm, he tunnels deeper in the soil to eat already composted soil. He's not looking for the stuff up top to be composted. He wants to eat what's already been broken down. So you don't want that earthworm for your compost. He's great for your garden because he's going to aerate your soil, but he's not going to compost for you. Both are great for your garden, but both perform very different jobs. So Red Wriggler, he's a surface dweller. He's decaying matter at or near soil surface, loves heat. His superpower? Dun, 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 dun. You ever thought of a super worm? He turns kitchen scraps and garden waste into usable compost, which I love. Common earthworm, he tunnels up to six feet deep 
He loosens and aerates the soil. He's already composted soil deep underground. And he doesn't like heat though. He won't like being in your compost bin because they get warm, especially if you're adding stuff because it is a compost bin, it will warm up and he will leave. He will try to dive deeper to escape and basically die or he'll figure out how to get out. Superpower for him, dun, 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 super for, is aerating soil by digging deep tunnels in the ground. Great for your garden. Love the earthworm, but so, you know. And note, red wrigglers are an invasive species in Alaska, so try not to introduce those to the wild. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want Heidi to call me be like, hey. So don't, don't, don't do that. Where to purchase composting worms? So if you want composting worms, you can get them from your local feed store, local garden store, online, or from a local worm farmer. I did call around and was able to get a hold of a couple local worm farmers. Uh, Tim Pritchett in Anchorage, his Facebook is Tim's Plants, Produce, and Worms. And I listed there his contact information. He actually sells to Alaska Mill and Feed, who is the next compost, I mean, um, next contact on that list. So you can call him directly, get it cheaper, or you can go to Alaska Mill and Feed and get it, you know, at what's convenient to you. So online, Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. So one of the things with ordering online is that the like Uncle Jim's Worm Farm, which I just found out to include me in on this one, is that they use local worm farmers across the United States. So basically whoever has it available is closer is gonna ship it to you. So that means that they can't guarantee that you're getting all red wrigglers. And if they're doing it outside, there's good chances that they've had other worms invade their worm farm at some point, right? Which isn't necessarily bad until you throw them all in your bin and the barometric pressure changes and you have all these blue worms leaving the bin or it drops below 60 and they die. But usually if they're mixed in, you're not even gonna notice if a couple have gone, right? The bulk of them are still gonna be your red wrigglers. So just so you know, when you get your worms, there could be a chance that they're not all going to be the same. So you want to kind of ask around when you get your worms and, and see that you're getting, you know, your money's worth of what you wanted and not something that's going to die on you or leave. So the Alaska Feeder Farm in Wasilla, she's awesome. She um, does get worms in as well, the earthworms as well as all kinds of other worms and bugs. So you could try her. And if she doesn't have it available, she will order it in for you as well. And then any questions? No? Uh, well, I just have a comment um, for Tim. I did buy some compost worms from him and he does keep them outside, but they were all red wigglers. Yeah, um, that's because, well, here in Alaska, we are kind of cut off from the lower 48. So you're not going to have those running loose here because they can't survive here. So right, not, no, outdoor you know. worms were great. <laughs> oh, his outdoor worms were great. They, they last yeah. all winter and everything. It was yeah, yeah worth it for Tim. Yes, I, I've got um, a slide coming up soon about his setup and how he does things. And Ooh. I like him. He's great of if you want to know anything about worm composting outside or how he does things. He his Facebook page, he's got all kinds of information and he's like totally into educating people about worm farming. So feel free to contact him. Um, but yes, um, I really enjoyed talking to Tim about his worm farm. So um, but yeah, thank you for pointing that out. If it's out here in Alaska and in Southside, you don't have to worry as much about invasive species, because the only thing you're going to get is that common earthworm. You're not going to get all the other species of worms, because they just can't live here. So anybody else? No one? Okay, so this might actually take you two hours. I'm really sorry. Setting up your worm farm. So what you need to set up the worm bedding, I'm going to freeze past some of this. A lot of people use coconut core bricks, shredded newspaper, cardboard pieces. You can shred it through, if you've got a big enough uh, paper shredder, shred it through the cardboard through all that. 
my dad actually uses a wood chipper and puts his cardboard in it and he uses that for bedding for his rabbits and I was thinking oh my gosh I'm so going to go do that for my worms but um one of the things you want to remember when picking your bedding you don't want a lot of toxins and inks so avoid the shiny advertisements with all the colored inks um you can use your bills that's great scrap papers newspapers grocery bags Toilet paper rolls, heck, toilet paper rolls, I throw them in whole. They break down so fast, and but I use them whole because they kind of give a little structure to the soil and um, keeps it from being pack, packing down so fast. Um, even like the cardboard egg cartons, that works great for that. Um, or another way of mixing bedding, some people use one part peat moss, one part soil, one part aged manure. When I say aged manure, I'm talking like composted already, basically cow poop or maybe even horse poop. Do not use pet litter, no dog or cat manure. And the reason for this is one, it stinks the highest heck, but also they tend to eat things that introduce more diseases and pathogens that you don't want to your compost than an animal that's eating grass, you know? So don't put cat or dog poop in there. I, I wouldn't, I, I don't even put my bird poop in it. I've got some um, quail in the house, a couple of them. I don't put that in there just because it's hot and because of the, the uric acid, you know, the ammonia smell, it's too much. If you put too much of it, you can put a little, little bit, but if you put too much, it's going to, upset your pH of your whole ecosystem. They're not going to like it. It's going to stink. So if you're going to use manure, get some good cow or horse poop put in there, aged preferably so it doesn't stink so bad. But with bedding, some people say, oh, you, you bedding is like the most important thing. and You have to have it this way. I just threw a coconut core in there, some newspaper and some cardboard, you know, and did it. And you just want to make sure it's moist and that you feed them. That's it. So, I mean, you can give them anything and they'll turn it into what they need. Worm habitat. What do they prefer? They, the ideal temperature for them is 70 to 75 degrees for the wrigglers. Dark. Put a light over your toe until the worms get established. Light pushes them deeper into the bedding. They want it moist, not wet. Um, so fluff up about 68 inches of bedding in their toe to put them in. When you first introduce them and food blend oh this is super important when you feed your worms super important freeze it <laughs> you can blend it and freeze it or you can just freeze it or you can freeze it thaw it blend it freeze it it will kill any bugs or uh bug eggs that are in it and you might think that that apple you just ate or the one that you sat on your counter and went bad is good and doesn't have anything nasty in it but i can tell you now when you throw it in your bin chances are good that it had some kind of bug or bug egg in there somewhere even if you washed outside of it don't don't do it so um freeze it and when you freeze it it helps to break down starts starts a decom um, decomposing process already by just breaking apart all the cell molecules and just, it's easier for the worms to eat um, and decompose. So freeze it. If you blend it, it also helps. You have a less chance of, of having bugs and bug eggs in it, even just blending it. But um, freezing it is really just the best way to do it. Make sure you thaw it good before you give it to them. But um, small pieces, you want small pieces, your worms don't have big mouths, and the bigger it is, the longer it's going to take to break it down. Um, shoot for a neutral pH of seven. I don't use a pH anything in there to see what it is. I just watch my worms in their environment. If you think that you're having issues with your pH, eggshells, if you grind them up small, they help to reduce the pH. Um, uh, while acidic, oily, or salty foods raise it. If they're not happy, your burns will, sorry, your worms will leave. 
You'll find them crawling out in places you didn't think they could fit and you will not be able to keep them in there. So when you're first getting them established, put a light over the top, make sure you've got everything set up. If you see that they are leaving, go through that list on the side and check and make sure everything's hunky-dory, something is off and they're not happy. Maybe you just forgot to feed them or didn't feed them enough, or maybe they just are just upset from the move and give them a day, keep, put them back in there and they're good. What do worms eat? Worms will eat almost anything. But you know, that doesn't mean you should feed them everything. You want to give them your vegetables, your fruit. Oh, they love melon rinds and they love cucumbers. Um, if you want to harvest your worms by hand, you can put a melon rind on top and the worms will all come up to the melon rind. You just flip it over and plunk it into your new bin and there's all your worms. So uh, plants, green or brown, not infested, diseased or sprayed. Paper waste. I'm going to tell you now, if you put an envelope that has one of those plastic shields in there, even if you think you pulled out that shield, you're going to have plastic in there. And actually, I think even just the security envelopes have a clear plastic lining inside of them, a very thin one, because every time I put an envelope through my shredder and put it into my compost for my worms, I end up with little tiny strips of plastic. Just don't do it to yourself. I've been forever picking plastic out of there because of this. I don't do, I don't do um, envelopes anymore. You put eggshells crushed, beans and peas fresh or soaked, cooked and dried, whatever. Throw them in there, they'll eat them. Do not put meat, fish, bones, grease, fat, dairy. They stink. Citrus fruit contains um, deolimonene, whatever, that harms worms. They don't like it. So try not to put citrus in there. Large amounts of starch or bread, it's harder for them to break down. It, it compacts into a mass and can stink. So don't do that. Pet waste, diseases, don't, don't do it. It stinks and it's bad. Disease or infested plants or soil, don't put it in there. If you, you know, don't put in what you don't want to take out. Um, plastics, leave them out. Insecticides, chemical treated plants or products, don't put them in. You want to blend your food, chop it small or freeze it and it works. It's not a complete listing, check elsewhere. Here's just like, um, like a compost feel of what, you know, you might want to put in there to help keep it like happy. And this explains the tray thing. Moving on. Okay, any questions? No? Nope, there's a question. Um, Heather asked, do you have a preferred cleansing process for the eggshells more than just initial rinse dry? Oh, no, I don't rinse, I don't dry them. I take them, crush them. Sometimes I'll put them in a plastic thing and crush them. Sometimes I just put them in my hands and crush them. You can crush them smaller if you want. You can put them in a little mortar. You can put them in a bag and bang the hell out of them if you want. I take them, crush them in my hands, throw them in there and turn them in. I don't cook them. Never a problem. I mean, so long as they're not sitting on the counter rotting, they're fine. They're going to break down and be part of the ecosystem long before salmonella is going to set in. So any other questions? One thing that I forgot to put in there for feeding, um, I use like a container, a big container. I used to have a two gallon bucket with a lid. And it ended up disappearing. I have no idea where it went, but I use like the big um, cottage cheese containers I was talking about. And you can put a lid on it. And if you put a lid on it, it helps keep the bugs out. It helps keep you know smells contained until you can deal with it as you want. Every day though, our container disappears. It either goes to the birds, the pigs, or to the worms. So. I mean, um, that's just one way to keep it contained so you don't have scraps sitting around. You could throw it into the container, pop it in the freezer, and just add to it until you want to deal with it if you wanted to. Just make the life easier. In the wintertime, Tim says he puts his in a grocery bag and just hangs it on the door outside and lets it freeze. So, any other questions? No? Harvesting. Haha. <laughs> All different types of harvesting. This is the one that you would use in a tote. So you would put the food to one side, you're gonna wait about a week. I think a week would be enough. They say three weeks, 
but all the worms are going to move over to that end and you can start taking out from the other end. And um, that, work, that method works really well if you're just going for the, the compost, the castings versus the worms. If you want the worms, you put the fruit on top, the bait, and they'll come straight to that. The pyramid method is doo -doo -doo -doo, right here. This, you take a tarp and you dump your bucket of, of compost on it. The light, you know, is driving your worms deeper so you can harvest off the top and the worms are on the bottom. And you just keep doing that and driving them down deeper and harvesting. That's the pyramid method. So then there's screens. This is the screen harvesting method. You can put it over another bin on top of the tart, however you want to do it. And then you put your compost on the top and light is driving the worms down or you can, so you can harvest it off the top, but, or um, you could just put it all in there, pick your worms out and use a little rate to put, drive the castings down. You can do it either way. Um, do flow through bin. So the flow through bin is basically like this, I guess. It's with the screen harvesting. And that's where you're, you're driving your worms deeper still. You're, you're light up top and they're going down. Um, side to side method was this one right here. And then, oops, sorry. Baiting. Baiting is the one, you know, you put the melon or whatever on top and they come to it and you take them out, plop them into a clean container with bedding and everything. And you do it until, I mean, sometimes it can take like three weeks to get all your worms out, but you just keep at it until your worms are gone. And then you have all your compost. You might want to pick some castings, I mean, not castings, but the little eggs out. But, you know, and they have like a worm casting harvester. There's plans um, one of the resource links at the end. Here's your mechanical harvester down here. Um, any questions on harvesting? I'm trying to hurry through for you guys. I'm sorry. Anything? I honestly didn't think that I would be able to come up with enough to talk about that would fill two hours. And now I'm just blown away by this. I'm sorry if you guys are getting bored or if I'm talking too fast. But I want to make sure you get everything. No, this is amazing. Um, so, you know, people had to leave just because they had to, other things to do. But, um, yeah. you know, they uh, wanted to make sure that um, they, you knew they appreciated it. So keep going. It's fine. I know it's a lot. It is a lot. And when I first started, there wasn't a lot of information on this. And I've just been trial and error. So I was blown away by the amount of information online when I got online to, to find all this. I was like, Ugh. So it's taken me actually a lot to get it down to this. Vermicompost tea. So there's two different methods, but first, what is vermicompost tea? So compost tea is tea made from steeping or brewing compost instead of tea leaves. Don't drink this. Vermicompost tea is compost tea that was brewed using vermicompost or vermicast. The worm casting is the compost from your bin. So the nutrients and beneficial microbes in the compost diffuse into the water, making liquid fertilizer for your plants. Two ways to make compost tea with worm castings. The basic method is simple steeping. And so the aerated is on the wrong line. That's supposed to go down with the brewed version. But so anyways, the, um, oh yeah, vermicompost tea, not the same as the liquid you find at the bottom of your worm bin. The, you can use it on your plants, but it's not concentrated. It's basically just the runoff. And while it might have some nutrients, it's basically water or whatever juice you just dumped in there. Um, the vermicompost tea, you're taking all the compost and putting it in there and it's concentrated yumminess for your plants. And it's, it's totally different. So this is, if you really want an in-depth scientific explanation of worm tea, here it is for yum worms, and I'm going to pass it. Why worm castings tea? Fresh earthworm castings contain more organic matter, and I can't read through the wonderful thing up there, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium than soil itself, according to Texas AgriLife Extension Service. Worm castings and the tea you make also ward off root knot nematodes a parasite creature that causes deformed roots and drain nutrients out of plants. Plants like strawberries that tend to attract fungal spores will also benefit. 
castings contain antifungal chemicals that help kill the spores of black spot and powdery mildew. So that's all wonderful things that you want your plants to have access to. So why not do it would be the other question, right? Can't think of a reason. How to make worm castings teas. It's just a simple method that I found uh, a recipe. So this woman, she's using two cups of worm castings, corn syrup or molasses or some sugar source. Put it in a five gallon bucket by way of like pantyhose or something to hold it in in water. And she's just letting that fester and do its thing, right? And she's leaving it in there to do it in, um, to brew and then uses it within 48 hours. So here's the thing with the corn syrup. So you're adding a sugar source and this increases beneficial microorganisms. It's feeding all those pathogenic microbes. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's feeding everything. Dun, 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 dun. If you suspect your worm compost contains harmful microbes, do not add the molasses as it does feed them as well. So no sugar source if you suspect there's anything off with your compost. If everything's hunky-dory, you haven't had any issues, you haven't put any diseased anything in there, don't worry about it and do your thing. So here's um, another method of doing it. So this one um, was another simple method. It does not contain the sugar. It's just the compost. I put this picture down here at the bottom because they're actually selling the worm compost in these little, it looks like maybe like t-shirt type material, knit material closed up. And they're selling those um, to make compost tea. But I thought it was a great example of what you could put it in to put inside of your um, buckets. And you could do up several of those and keep them somewhere if you wanted to. So, um, da -da -da. so da -da. yeah, so this is just same thing, but without the sugar. So there's that one. The aerated brood method. This is what I've always thought of when thought I thought of making compost tea. This is what, how my dad does it for the rabbit poop tea that he does for his garden. It's five gallon bucket, four gallons of water, um, some sort of sugar source. I don't think he even adds the sugar to his, but the aquarium aerator. So you want that. You want to stick that sucker in there and have a bubble. And then about four to six cups of worm castings. You can put it in a container, keep it contained if you want, or you can just let it do its thing. You can either filter it out or dump it straight on your plants, whatever you want to do, either way. Um, but you're going to turn that on and let it bubble and brew for about three days, stir it up on occasion. And so you want to use this pretty much right away, just because the longer it sits, the more microbes, all the beneficial stuff that's alive in there is going to start to die off. So the sooner you use it, the better. And this lady uh, says, if you add two cups of alfalfa pellets, then it adds extra nitrogen if you want it. Using worm castings tea. So when you make compost and renew tree, it's concentrated. And you don't want to put concentrated stuff on your plants because you can burn it or just overdo everything. And see it, um, what's it called? It uh, throws them out of balance. It, uh, can't think of it. So anyways, you want to water it down. So try a three to one ratio. Then it can be added to your garden during regular watering, used on your house plants, used as a foliar fertilizer when sprayed on plant leaves, which I read that um, they've, they said that plants really, some plants really benefit from having it sprayed on their leaves. Um, if you use a very weak five parts water to one part tea on new vegetables, herb and flower, I think that's supposed to be starts, <laughs> sorry. But, um, yeah, so there's worm castings tea. Any questions? None? Actually, how often are you applying the fertilizer? To so if you're applying the worm casting tea, you can use it every time you're watering. It's not gonna hurt them. If you're using just the castings, um, you shouldn't have to apply them a lot because like I said, they're gonna, you put it on at like at the beginning of the season, it should be slowly letting out nutrients through the entire season. 
If you see towards the end of the season, your plants need a little bit more of a perk because they're putting off all this produce, all these um, fruits and things, you can add more to it. And it's not, it doesn't burn your plants. It doesn't hurt them. You just put it right on top underneath your plants on right on top of the ground. So. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. Local worm farmers. Tim Pritchett, awesome guy, love talking to him. This is a picture he had on his Facebook page and he, he told me, go ahead and use whatever I needed off there. Sorry, my nose, my allergies are killing me. I saw the doctor, allergies, so excuse my sniffles. It's gross. He does have a big system set up outside and those big bags of um, garbage bags are full of leaves and he uses those to insulate his pile of worms. And he said that even in January, February, when it was cold and there was snow, he was able to shovel the snow off, lift up those bags and access his worms. They were alive and in composting. They're granted, they're not gonna be as active and they're probably not gonna like be reproducing as much, but they lived. And one of the things with the worms is someone said that um, the adults, they, they'll freeze, but the eggs will make it. So I don't know if that's true for the red wrigglers, if the eggs get killed off after a certain temperature or not, but um, he's able to keep his alive all winter with that system. So I mean, it's not pretty, but it's functional. And I tell you, I'm all about functionality. I'm, I don't care about looks. So he said he's moving toward the continuous flow through design and away from the upward migration setup. And it's just not as um, productive as, or as easy. So the continuous flow through is really nice because you're just constantly adding and then taking. You add and you take, add and take. So it's nice. Um, he said with the board migration setup, the first couple of trays you go through may not be fully composted, put those back and have them do it again. And uh, we went over what the top one was. So the bottom picture there, he was, it was an example of baiting springtail. So I talked about baiting um, the worms with melon. You can also bait mites or other things with melon. They love melon. And um, if you don't, I put it right side down. It doesn't attract the worms as quick as it does the mites and things that are a lot more on the surface. And they'll um, cover the melon. And you can take that whole thing and throw it away, or you can rinse it and put it back in and get a whole nother batch of mites or whatever. I've used mine on mites. He was using his for springtail. And um, he put his in his hot compost outside. If, if I have any kind of infestation, I throw it away because I don't want it anywhere else in my garden. But teach their own. I don't trust my composting abilities outside enough to feel comfortable that it's going to get hot enough to kill all those bug eggs. And I don't want it in my own tunnel. Um, so he's got his Facebook page title on there. And if you Google the search thing, composting with worms, you, you will get a whole list of all this stuff. And he, it is for the community and, and please check him out and talk to him. He love it. Lisa Christie, I spoke to her and she sent me some information on how she does some things. She's a no, another local worm farmer up in the Anchorage area. She is busy this season though, um, driving the tour buses. So if you do get a hold of her and you, I mean, email her, you might not hear back right away, but she very much is into educating and sharing. She's got tons like, so it says down there, started two years ago with one couple of worms. And now she has eight 10 gallon totes of worms and she's even sold some worms. So um, contact her if you are in that area and you need worms or if you want to know how she does things. Um, there's this. And like I said, I can send all this to you guys so you know. So this is another big thing is troubleshooting. Mold, pest, desertion, and smell, right? Troubleshooting, excessive moisture. If you open your lid and there's moisture everywhere, well, you're either overfeeding wet scraps or you're just too much moisture and you're bedding and proper ventilation. To cut back on the wet scraps. I add dry bedding. Make sure you have good ventilation, okay? Um, mold. Keep your food scraps buried. You shouldn't have mold. You shouldn't have stench. You shouldn't have any of these issues so long as you are 
taking your food, burying it, and you have proper ventilation, everything should be hunky dory. I mean, um, don't overwater your bedding. My paper stuff, when I put it in there, I soak it in water overnight to start the decomp and to give them the moisture they need because I have issues keeping it moist. And then I just take that, strain it, and feed it through the next day. Well, another thing is on the top to help with the moisture, I take that sh same shredded newspaper and put it over the top of my soil in my worm bed. And you can spritz it or you can leave it dry depending on the moisture level inside of your worm bin. And it helps keep the moisture in and it gives adequate air access. And I found that that works better than putting like a straight piece of newspaper or anything over the top because just a straight piece of newspaper or the paper bags mold. They get black mold on them. When you shred the paper and put it on the top, it's got enough air circulation. The worms are coming in and out of it and it's not molding. And that stuff, you just work it down into the bedding, you know, over time when you feed and stuff and they make it part of the compost. Pests. Oh, I was on smell, huh? So if you're smelling stuff and you're overfeeding or you're feeding them something you shouldn't be feeding, um, check your ventilation, check what you're feeding them. Pests. So your worm bin is an ecosystem. You're going to get some bugs in there that are not worms. And that is just fine. They're going to help with the composite uh, decomposing of your nutrients in your worm bin. They're helping with your composting. So long as you don't get things that are going to eat your worms, like the air, earwigs that I got, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, mostly mites are the number one issue and they're not the same mites you would find on the plants in your house. It's a totally different mite and they tend to stay in your worm bin. They don't like the environment outside of it and will not live. So you don't have to worry about it going and infesting your house. It's staying right there. But if you do have some pests and you wanna know what they are or how to get rid of them, down further, there's a um, controlling nuisance neighbors page that lists some of them out, the more common ones and how to deal with them. If your worms are leaving, any recent changes in your worm bin or if you've moved it or you fed them something different or it got hotter, or colder, or something that might be the problem and you need to um, figure out you know, what changed and correct it and they'll stay there. If you want to make sure that they're staying while you figure it out, put the lamp over the top and it'll keep them contained. But do figure out what's wrong because if something is off where they're unhappy enough to leave, then that probably means they're leaving so they don't die. And if you're making them stay, they're just going to die. So, um, oops, nuts. What'd I do? There. Um, worms disappeared. Worms only reproduce to fit the size of their environment. If their numbers have suddenly declined and you haven't found a trail of dead, dried worms leading away from their bin, you may not be feeding them enough. I almost killed mine doing that. Turn their bedding for signs of old food scraps. If you don't find any or at least few, then chances are you're starving your worms. After feeding your worms, check to see how quickly they finish it and adjust your feedings from there. Do not overfeed because then that's how you get the smell and the mold and the bugs. So basically when you first start off, you wanna pay attention to how fast they are eating whatever amount it is that you feed them. Sometimes you can feed them once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, depending on how many are in your bed and how much you're feeding them at a time. And it just is whatever is, works for your ecosystem for your worms. So make sure that you know what that is and just keep an eye on it to begin with until you know. So these are a bunch of different bugs that you might find in your worm bin. Um, like I said, it's an ecosystem. And so if you want it to be healthy, it's going to end up pulling in all these other things. Some of them you want to get rid of. So mites and springtail. You don't want springtail. Mites, mites are okay, depending on what kind it is. And, um, but this is a list of what you can do to help get rid of them or, you know, um, control them. Fruit flies, you don't want fruit flies. They're not gonna help you uh, hurt your compost, but they're annoying. I actually have a little 
it looks like a little tomato and it's a fruit fly trap that I got from Fred Meyers really cheap and I put vinegar in it and um if I get any fruit flies which I don't normally because I usually keep up with my worm bin but if I happen to get something I stick it down in there um, on the top of all the bedding and the worms don't crawl in it because it's just sitting on top it's not level with the dirt it's just sitting on top and it, it attracts them. It also attracts those earwigs and some of the other things that you don't want in your bin. So you can use it for lots of different things. Uh, centipedes, remove by hand, be careful because they have pinchers. Otherwise you're not gonna get rid of them. And this is one of the reasons why I go through my worm bin and I turn it and check out what's going on in there because sometimes even with it being enclosed, you're gonna find things and I swear they come off the food or. Actually, sometimes I think they just conjure up on their own out of thin air, but you won't know what's happening in your worm bin if you don't dig through it on occasion. And you don't have to do it all the time, once a month, you know, turn it. So all that stuff on the bottom is now on top and it's not all crushed up and heavy and solid. And, and then it all gets composted better too, if it's all getting mixed in. But then that way, you know who's moved in and who might cause issues before it happens. Slugs and snails, you know, you don't want those. And, but you know, I've never found any of those things other than the mites, the fruit flies and the earwigs. I've never found an ant, but don't use insecticides in there. Um, so Tim says he takes his whole bin if he has anything that's um, infested it. His whole worm bin sets it outside in the middle of winter, just long enough to freeze the top layer where all these pest bugs like to live. And, not long enough to freeze the bottom layers where all of those worms are going to dive down to to stay warm, warm and safe. And then he brings them back in and all those things are dead. So that's a good way of killing them. Blow flies up. Oh, no one wants those. Even though soldier flies, their maggots are great at composting. You don't want them. So they tend to like meat, grease and pet waste. So don't put that stuff in there and you shouldn't have an issue. Bury it and you shouldn't have an issue. Good habits of maintaining your worm bin go a long way to controlling unwanted neighbors in your worm farm. And also helps keep your worms healthy and strong and reproducing and making that great compost you want. So remember to check moisture. You want it moist, but not wet. You should not be able to wring a drop of water out of it. Bury all your food scraps, preferably freeze it and blend it. Do not use or at least try to limit use of meats, dairy, grease, or high amounts of starches in one feeding. Um, no pet waste. Absolutely don't do it. Variety is the spice of life. If you don't like eating the same thing every day, neither do your worms. Try to feed your worms a variety of foods to help keep their pH in a healthy range. Neutral is what you're shooting for. And like I said, I don't use strips. Excessive use of coffee grounds um, is not good for your worms either. It's very acidic. It's going to destroy the pH of your whole system. I know my husband, when he's home, four pots of coffee a day, too much for anyone, right? Not for my husband. And where do the coffee grounds go? Into my worm bin. I had to put a stop to that because, wow, it's too much. So, you know, just, you know, balance. Um, if you have a lot of something and you Feed it a little to your worm, take the rest out to the compost bin or um, straight to the garden. You can sprinkle coffee grounds out in the garden. Be familiar with your worm's eco neighbors, knowing who is moving in and be aware of their numbers before you go from worm farm to bug metropolis. And so that's that. Any other questions so far? I know it's getting close to time. Are we good? So red wriggler, anatomy, life cycle and reproduction. Aha, there's a pretty picture of your red wriggler. See, he's got his yellow tail and he's got these little bands. So these are what you wanna see on the red wriggler. And here is that, I always called it a little band-aid, but that is his reproductive unit. It'll tell you what it is down here soon. So there's stages of your worm. And I think it's important to know these if you're gonna be doing this because then you can understand your worms. You need to understand worms to know how to handle, right? So you get your cocoon or egg stage, which is right here with this tiny little baby worm coming out. Right there. Then there's the juvenile stage, the mature adult stage and the mating stage. 
a worm uh, can live four to five years. Oh my God. I want to know how they know how old that worm is compared to the other worms. I want to ban them. I wonder if you can ban them or tag them or something. I want to know. Anyway, cocoon or egg stage. It's smaller than a grain of rice, lemon-like shaped, yellow in color. Incubation period is about 23 days. Chain, they change in color from a golden yellow to deep red as the worms develop inside the cocoon. Four to six red wriggler worms are in each cocoon. They hatch at anywhere between 65 and 85 degrees. And that's their optimum temperature range. Incubation period lasts three to four weeks. So I did just recently pull out a bunch of those little cocoons because I wanted to see them hatch. That's not my picture, but I wanted to see that happen. So I was thinking, ooh, I wonder if I could set that up in my incubator, but they're just on the counter in some little bedding where I can watch them. Uh, juvenile stage, they hatch from cocoon egg. Juveniles are no more than half an inch. No genital markers or uh, clotelum. Organic waste consumer straight from hatching. So as soon as the tiny little, tiny little thing comes out, he's eating stuff. He's working for you. And they're good, good as an adult worms for composting. Oh, that turned without me touching it. Mature stage, juvenile worms turn into an adult. 40 to 60 days from juvenile to mature adult. They develop genital markers, markings, so the clotellum. Um, that would be these things here. Clotellum contains the reproductive organ and is only seen when ready to reproduce. That's, the, that's that, what I was calling the band-aid. They're ready to mate when the clotellum is orange in color. And that's what these guys are doing. If you ever see these guys connected, don't pull them apart. Um, so they have both male and female reproductive organs. And, but I read some contradictions here. I read in one spot where it says that they can self-reproduce, but then I read a more recent article that says, no, you have to have two worms to reproduce. Because as you can see, like this reproductive thing here is not connected to this reproductive thing now. Um, they become sexually active as weather warms up. They mate by joining clotellums together, their heads pointing in opposite directions to each exchange sperm. Later, each worm secretes the cocoon from the clotellum. So that band-aid comes off. It's so cool. Then the worms back out from the narrowing cocoons and fertilization takes place. So that that is that is going to eventually be the cocoon. So cool. Well, facts about earthworms. When earthworms tunnel through the ground, they bring air into the soil. This allows plant roots to grow more easily. Earthworms will eat almost anything that was once living but is now dead. If a worm is cut in half, only the part of the body that has the head will live. More than 3,000 species of earthworms exist in the world. You know, I'm glad to hear number three because, you know, it would be kind of freaky if you could cut one in half and get two. So that, that's reassuring. A uh, worm is a hermaphrodite since it has both male and female reproductive organs. Worms cannot hear, they cannot see, but that doesn't stop them. Worms can have between one and five pairs of hearts. Earthworm does not have lungs and instead uses its skin to breathe. So that's one of the reasons for the water moisture level. They can't breathe if they dry out, they can't breathe if it's too wet. So you need to keep that moisture level right. Worms are cold blooded and their body is made up of 80% water. Oh, and as soon as they leave their bin, I mean, almost right away they dry out and die. It's like crispy. Worms typically live for about three to four years. However, there have been some cases where they have lived for 15 years. Geez, not in my house. Worms help our environment. Worms are mother nature's composters. The right worm in the right place can be a great help, especially for gardeners. So I love these pictures. So we are at the end of this, just so you know, there's light at the end of this earthworm tunnel. So this is the life cycle of the earthworm. And I wanted to show you this because it's freaking amazing. And I'm gonna start with the cocoon or egg casing, may contain a few to dozens of eggs, depending on the species of uh, worm. So the hatchling, tiny white thread-like worms. Then you've got the juvenile. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And then here's the adult. See, he's got his clotellum. And here they are reproducing. But do you see that little clotellum? It's coming off and it's going to be that egg. Isn't that amazing? I, I, I think it's fascinating. And these show the same thing. That formation of that cocoon comes right off and there's the eggs. I think it's pretty cool. 
little bit of worm anatomy. I just could not pass by some of these pictures. And I, you know, I really feel like if you understand how your worm functions, you can understand how to take care of them. And I just thought it was really freaking cool. So here's that clitellum and his hearts are these little bands. I thought it was cool. But oh, the bands I was telling you about are these segments right here that you'll find on the um, regular. This is just a better, more condensed picture if you just want to know real quick. So earthworms is something I missed earlier in telling you. If you add a little grit, a little gravel, a little sand or something, and eggshells work for that too, to your bedding, it's helpful because like chickens, worms have gizzards. I didn't know that. And a crop, just like a chicken. I love it because chickens are my other favorite animal. But so there's that. And this is basically the whole compost um, pyramid. And it's great too. Resources. Here's all your resource links. Everything that I found that was amazing and wanted to share with you. Some of it I wasn't able to put in. I'm so sorry about all the time this has taken. But there it all is. Just that I had two hours to fill. And like I said, I was blown away by how much information there actually is out there now on earthworms and worm farming because there wasn't when I started.